I'm uh, pleased to take us into the marathon. We've all had our energy drinks, and we're going to try and go that last five kilometers and um, keep us all energized as we come to the end of Drone and Able 2. To begin this last session, I'm going to provide an overview of a project that ICAO has been working on in collaboration with many of you and also with regulators to prototype an aircraft registration network with early applicability, we believe, in this space for drones, particularly for the UAS, but also with applicability that we think will be uh, valuable for the larger aviation community going forward. As Bill Voss talked about yesterday, we're trying to bring the international aviation regulatory framework out of the paper-based certificate process that was established by ICAO in 1944 and move it into the 21st century, utilizing digital certificates. And one of the early innovators in digital certificates is right here in China. Civil Aviation Authority of China proposed to me last year that ICAO should look at adopting a digital pilot license. And they showed me an app. Now most of you have been in Chengdu for most of the week. You found that most people here pay for everything with their smartphone. And they, they travel around, they, they pay for their metro, they pay for their food, they exchange money with each other, all with a smartphone. You can go downstairs and get real cash with your smartphone. So they proposed to me that the digital pilot license that they put on smartphones, which has over 45,000, I think maybe 50,000 users in China, all of the commercial airline pilots in China, this is their license flying in the country. And they said, we'd like them to be able to use this digital license when they leave China, when they go to Europe or when they go to North America. Okay. So how do we describe that reality to the regulator in North America or in Europe? and have them accept that digital license that's on the smartphone. So we've begun a project at ICAO, separate from this conversation, but it's just a taste of what's coming. It's the idea that everything that we formerly thought we would do to regulate on paper is going to move into the digital age over the next probably five years. It's not going to take long because many of you are already doing prototype projects of that nature. So last year at Drone Enable, we talked about doing the same thing for aircraft registration. Now I'm going to ask for the uh, slides to go up and then I'll figure out which projector I'm supposed to use. I think we've got some slides for this. Perfect. Nah. Well, I killed it. Wow. Okay, let's try again. So I'll start with the recap. There's been a lot of advance in small drones. We've heard about it all week. The 39th Assembly told us to take a leading role in the registration and identification of drones. One of the absent topics here that I think I, I would like to hear more about is the interaction between drone manufacturers and law enforcement because much of the, the law that we have to be challenged by in this space is not aviation law. It's, uh, it's sim simple policing and law enforcement. It's uh, nuisance for privacy. It's, it's concerns about security. All of those things. So one of the key elements that state governments need is the ability to be able to identify a drone and who is operating it as rapidly as possible so that they can reconcile some of these challenges. So we were proposing that we would bring standardization to the process and a data set for the registration of drones, a global data set. We would provide states with their own capability to customize their registration process if they wanted to utilize this tool but we would also provide a system of connections so that states who have their own systems, like China, the United States, and others, would be able to interoperate through this network system. I have the wrong remote. So what do states need? I spoke about it briefly, law enforcement. When infractions do occur, states need to ensure that they can take an enforcement action. But just as much, they need to be able to by example, show that compliance with the rules or the guidance that they have issued in their own locale is important to people. Just like when you get a ticket speeding in your car, they don't give tickets to everyone who's speeding, but they're reminding the entire community that you need to be careful. Traffic management, we've talked a lot about UTM and making it interoperable, and I don't think I need to share more about that. So the current situation with states most don't have a registration system at all. 
And if they do, it's certainly not portable or extendable beyond their own national borders. If they do have a system, they're having a hard time keeping up. We heard about one country with over 800,000 registered drones already, more than two and a half, three times the number of civil aircraft registered in their state. There isn't consistency on what's required yet. There's no ability to identify or contact operators and no ability to track, track bone, drones across borders. It's not an international flight. It's going to be somebody like me. Somebody who says beyond all reasonable doubt, well, I think I'm going to bring my drone to China, see if I can't find a place to fly it. So we're proposing a system that connects these registries, both certified and uncertified vehicles, essentially information that can be utilized by states in a way that can be trusted and so that they can take advantage of it to build out the systems that they believe they need in their own environment. There will be application data fields that are produced in accordance with ICAO recommendations. The CAST ICAO uh, classifications for drone manufacturers and models would be utilized, so we'd have a standardized set of data there. We would facilitate international operations for states and for operators, and third-party applications would be developed to work with this data set, and it would also interact with state databases. For free, ICAO would provide these services for day-to-day -day drone registration activities. On the left-hand side, establish an end-to-end -end electronic process, receive registration applications from the public, process them to approve them or deny them, issue a certificate, and then have searches that are based on single data fields, etc. There is the opportunity to provide cost plus services. A payment processing module, so that if someone comes into your country, like the director of the Air Navigation Bureau trying to fly a drone in your country, you might charge him a small fee to process his uh, application to fly. You might uh, delegate operator functionality. I may not be the owner of that drone. International operator data access or a state permit for foreign ops. So I'm going to play this video, which we don't believe is actually going to look good on this screen, but essentially the prototype is I'm the state regulator, I need to design this web page so that I can interact through the ICAO system with my user community. And I'll go through here and I'll build a, a web page that has my banner, my logos, my own custom identity that is my state authority identity on the service. I'll have my contact details, the hours of operation, any of the things that I might want to put on a normal web page for commerce. I'll have instructions on how to fill it out, which portions of the website I might want to utilize, uh, whether it's an unmanned vehicle, if it's a formal application or an informal application, and then there would be extensibility for other capabilities as those requirements come in from the uh, states that are participating in the program. Then we would have our user, user registration web page. User registration page essentially is built by the operator. So this is what the web page looks like after you've assembled it. Our colleagues in Transport Canada have uh, kindly allowed us to have their logo on the top of this screen for demonstration purposes, but by no means accepting that they are going to be a participant at this point. But it's just the idea that when you log on, it looks like you're, you're sitting on a Transport Canada page, which is what we want the user to be looking at when they get to the website. And then they would go through a registration process which did not play. Well, we're not going to play the video because it, it essentially puts them in a position where they select their vehicle, the drone, put all of their contact information in, and then when it comes to the user or to the state's uh, process, the state regulator goes through, reviews, and approves the application. They essentially have a list of uh, submissions that have been made they go through and they can, they can build the um, required acceptance. The customer information is all drawn down at the bottom. There's a place to load up your uh, identity, the proof of ownership, etc. You can do all of that in a standard form, just like you would do in any other uh, web page, and then uh, submit it. So it can be approved or denied by the regulator, and then the information sent back. So there's two-way communications between the regulator providing this service 
and the operator of the vehicle. We would allow states to keep abreast of this uh, industry by continuing this development online. Now this is out of the norm for ICAO because at ICAO we usually produce something and then it sits in a static form for three years nominally or sometimes more. But because this would be a service that's going to evolve with the industry, our expectation is services would be added in a routine way that would keep pace with the UTM demands that are coming forward and some of the other activities that we think the states are going to want to have uh, included in this as they start to expand the applicability. One of those areas is for delegated operators in international operations. So for instance, the owner of a drone, the title holder, may not be the operator, and they would like to be able to delegate the operation of the drone to someone else. And they essentially could go in and on the website put a, a transfer of operation uh, approval into the um, website, which would then be approved or accepted by the regulatory authority so that they know who's operating the drone, wherever it might be in their own airspace. Title holder has custody and control. It's selected and changed. Now we've got to transfer to an operator. The, um, the applicant would see that there's a review in progress, and then they would see that it's accepted. The second uh, scenario would be for international operations where I intend to operate my drone in China. Now I might have an FAA Part 107 certificate and I would like for China to have access to that information. They may not, I may not know that they have access to that information through a draw in the interface in this program, but what I could do is, using this system, allow the, the state to have the information about my drone proactively as I come into the country. And essentially, in this case, I'm going to arrive at the beginning of the setup for r 3, and I'm going to depart China on the 16th to go home to Canada, and I can load this information in, select the link to the states where I might already have a registration, what the rules are in the state that I'm going to, and then they would have the opportunity to take local contact information, the name of the hotel that I'm staying at, the residence where I might be a guest, the telephone number where they can reach me, all of that information then becomes available should a local uh, policeman need to have access to that information because he has been able to identify that my drone is operating in the airspace. This is challenging when I try and speak Chinese to the local police officer when he's questioning my use of a drone. So in some ways this is helpful to have a structure that is accepted and sanctioned by the state involved. I travel all over the world with my drone and I try and find the rules. Having one place to go to find the rules that's kept current by the states involved would be very, very helpful because sometimes you're just not sure and you keep it in the bag. So, next steps. If you'd like to be part of this trial as a member of the industry, get in contact with us and let us know. If you'd like your state to be involved in this trial, get in contact with us and let us know. I think in some cases, getting states to be engaged and enthusiastic about this requires a proponent in their own operation who has an interest in this activity. So we'd also like feedback. One of the things I think was the most important benefit of going through this prototyping exercise was defining the requirements. What is truly going to be needed in the future? We don't actually have all of those answers in the small work group that helped us to define this initial program. And we think over the course of the next uh, year, it will be expanded substantially. But at the same time, we're trying to keep it simple so that it's a product that is very friendly for the operator and the user who wants to get engaged in this as they uh, work in the international arena with their vehicle. So we're looking for the industry support so that we can flesh this out to a higher degree and hopefully have in some prototype operations by Drone Enable 3 next year. So, thank you for your attention, and uh, I changed my mind. I was going to fly the drone, but I'm just almost sure that someone was going to come stop me. So, um, that's the end of the drone uh, registration, or the aircraft registration demonstration. And now I'd like to uh, ask uh, for the next slide deck to come up, which is going to be our summary slide deck. Now, our program is going to be one where we can... Um, I'll do a quick review of what we've heard over the last two days, and then I'm gonna ask 
all of the moderators for the different sessions that we've had to come up and take a seat, and they're going to critique our review and add to it, because essentially we're in an interactive dialogue for this last hour to make sure that we've covered all of the issues that we think we need to cover and to take away to continue the work here. So I'll ask uh, the moderators to uh, come on up. They, each of you knows that you are a moderator, so don't hesitate. And then I'm going to start going through a review very briefly of what was identified in your program, and you're going to add to it as we go forward. On Thursday morning, after our keynotes, our first session was on what is UTM and why is it separate from or but interoperable with ATM. Dr. Hiroko Nakamura was our moderator for that session and um, the session covered in brief a need for a concept, a common vision, language, reference points, and secure data exchange between UTM and ATM. A need for the international bodies, including ICAO, to play a key role in setting this vision, and a collaboration between the operators of the UTM and the air navigation service providers is essential to determine the conditions for interoperability with ATM. And we heard that there's a lot of dialogue happening in the last session before lunch. Sometimes it has a little friction, but the dialogue is there, and it's something that we're continuing to build on. In the next session, UTM and ATM transitions. Peter von Blomberg and uh, Dr. Liu Hao spent quite a bit of time provoking their protagonists in the uh, traditional and non-traditional approach to uh, the mix between the two programs. And I think that a key element that came out here was the idea of understanding the scope of operations so that you can define the rules and the interface requirements that this isn't a revolution, it's incremental, and it will evolve. But what we have to do is learn how to evolve it much more rapidly than we have traditionally done in the aviation space. We need the secure, reliable, accurate data and communication exchange, and there is a question about whether this should be centralized or decentralized. I keep pressing the laser. I'm surprised I haven't hurt somebody. Finally, Bill Voss walked us through ICAO's work on the global trust framework and its applicability in this field. Bill talked about the fact that we've been working on this because we recognize the need for secure, trusted communications in the data exchange environment. We're trying to establish an architectural concept that will withstand an evolution and that can be supported in all regions of the world. That we're working with the internet governing bodies essentially because we recognize most of this activity will ride on the internet and that it will need to have special protections to do so effectively. It must support all of our safety critical functions and a simple definition for that is if you need a regulatory approval for airworthiness or flight operations or ATM operations for the use of the application, then that's the target application for this capability. It may expand over time depending upon what's required in different parts of the industry, but that's the initial focus. And we see the new entrant community as an ideal place to rapid prototype and instill this capability in the industry. Mark Wunenberg gave us a readout or rundown of what ICAO has been doing over the past uh, year since Drone Enable 1 and talked about the fact that we're nearing the completion of the uh, first uh, guidance material on the framework. We, I wouldn't even call it formal guidance material so much as a guide for states on what their regulations may need to contain in order to be aligned with global expectations and the global direction for UTM. And then that um, the industry engagement with the regulator from the other side remains absolutely critical to that regulator's success in deploying a regulation that's meaningful and that has the right level of guidance or uh, rulemaking. 
And we expect that this is a living document. Again, we don't expect to publish a SARP here and be proscriptive and tell you how to do things for the next 20 years. We expect that this will evolve in a much more uh, dynamic fashion. Then we went into Beyond UTM. Michael Gadd walked us through the, uh, the requirement to re-examine our legacy systems, uh, look at flexibility and scale, the holistic risk evaluation that takes into account public needs, and I thought that was a really interesting point. You know, will you approve something where five people will die? No. Would you do it if it will save 3,000 lives? That's a compelling discussion. And in many parts of the world, the introduction of this technology is life-saving technology. Why would you wait for regulatory perfection to go forward with it if there is some risk that can be managed? And then interoperability. I think um, Johnny Walker was able to stimulate a good conversation here. Uh, we had some folks who simply said, we're just not ready for integration. Um, I heard loud and clear that the safety of the system cannot be compromised. I would challenge how the safety of the system cannot be compromised by a tripling of traffic in the standard commercial world, none, not to mention the introduction of new entrants. So our system will be challenged no matter what happens because of the dramatic growth that's happening in aviation today. So regulators are being challenged to change the way they regulate and assess and approve risk management because that's what's required for these integrations to be successful. And then we talked about the applicability for UTM and very high altitude operations, how they're common, and how actually high altitude operations are a great playground for a large part of what we're looking to do here. A lot of the same DNA, a lot of the same uh, technology capacity, none of the legacy that the traditional air traffic management, airspace management arena is facing. And there is industry cooperation in place because without it, your assets are at risk. And the business case for these assets actually says, let's protect the assets A and B, let's help the regulators come together here because we'd like to be in operations sooner than we expect them to be able to accomplish a regulatory framework through the ICAO method. And I think that's very real. If you begin today with trying to produce new regulations related to this airspace at ICAO, we're five years away from an implementation. But by doing it cooperatively, you can shave a lot of time off and still manage the risks that are being introduced. So, while we still believe you need ICAO, you need a different ICAO. And that ICAO is one that works very closely with the industry in places like Drone Enable to stimulate the conversations with the 192 regulators around the world from the perspective of the proponent each of you as a proponent has to go through a regulator in your home country to begin this talk about how to certify or approve your operation. And all of you knows that's just one regulator. And you have to have a lot of faith to believe that regulator is going to bring the right package to ICAO for consideration for global adoption. But we think with the collaboration that's happening here and the changes in the way that can, the communication can occur, we actually can stimulate prototyping in the field by your industry with your regulator that becomes essentially the frontline global development. It just has to be done with a global outcome in mind instead of a local outcome. And I think we're well on the way to that. So I think that's the end of the introductory slides. I'd like to open the floor now to uh, each of our uh, moderators to add their points, to correct any points they may see that I might have said incorrectly, and to hopefully challenge each other on these last set of uh, topics that we want everybody to take away from here on Friday afternoon in Shindu. Anybody want to go first? Nobody's bashful. I know there's a race for a mic. Perfect. <laughs> Mike? It's not hot yet. There you go. There we go. Um, I, think, I think for me, um, coming from an airworthiness and in particular a safety background, um, I've, 
I, I just wrote some notes as you were talking, Steve. Um, and I think it's a phrase I've heard many times, and it's been great to see the conversation these last few days. But there's like, the question for me is, you know, what is safety? What is safe enough? What does good look like? Um, we all have a major part to play, but ultimately, we have to recognize that whilst we might set the starting points, the decision will be held by politicians and the general public. If they're not happy, regulators will be forced to change things. So from my session this morning, I, I took away the need to understand what that might look like, and then to take those people, those decision makers and the general public on the journey with us so that we're all understanding what we are prepared to accept and how we can deal with that. Okay, that's great. I, I, think, I think you're exactly right. You know, all of us driving automobiles that pass two feet away from an automobile going in the opposite direction, we don't know the person driving that other automobile. It happens to us hundreds of times a day, but we have a history of knowing that it's going to be okay, generally. Anybody hazard to guess how often it's not okay? But society's all right with that because of the absolute functionality of what the automotive experience brings to them. And I think to some degree they do see that with drones. In many ways, they're going to be willing to tolerate risk that in the traditional aviation sense, we might not believe they would do because of our own history with the public on uh, their tolerance for risk in flying in an airplane. Yeah, I think maybe just to finish my final point, we're putting aviation into the high streets. Um, the perception of aviation will change enormously. Yeah. Uh, and that's why I feel it's important to understand what that means to the end user and how we address that. Okay. Thanks, Mike. John? So you captured uh, the, the essence of, of the uh, uh, effort very well. I believe, uh, and I'll speak to, to your homework assignment of my, my session, we scratched the surface. I, I believe in the planning that Leslie's going to do so well for the rest of this year for a Drone 3 is where do airports fit into this? We talked about uh, the UTM ATM, the reality. Yeah, there needs to be obviously a lot of work and understanding of bringing stakeholders together. Uh, in uh, Nancy's activity, I'd love to hear somebody from uh, commercial space and what their thoughts are. About, about the airspace activity. I think, as I said in my comments, Bill Voss's uh, message yesterday was powerful. The trust theme, especially what you just indicated, Steve, on the idea of a registration really has to come to play, and that's going to be governments uh, uh, as well as uh, regulators and, and aviation folks. The issue of industry with return on the investment, case in point, I would love to see more activity, as I said to you, Steve, candidly, in front of a bunch of friends here, uh, of the standards role of your bringing them together at ICAO. I think the idea that uh, Nancy uh, uh, and you have had as far as the, the round table is important. Case in point, RTCA has issued the, the initial phase one minimum operation performance standards for sense and avoid and command and control. Okay, how is it being used? When will the phase two be done? We've already had a couple of Lindbergh moments in the world here with um, a Global Hawk flying uh, across oceans. General Atomics recently flew in Nagasaki area uh, in Japan in civil airspace with the civil large uh, uh, UAS. These are one off. How do we start to really capture the importance of this so that when industry does make a key return on the investment, go back to the morning's keynote speak speech. This is very important for that to happen here. So I believe in, in, in just a summary, we have more information now at hand than we had at the end of, of uh, Drone Enable 2. I think that's important, but I really think you can take a quantum leap now as you prepare for the next time we come together. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, Okay, since you pass it to me, I will take the floor. I think uh, I would like to point out five, still five points for our session. The first key, key word is uh, co cooperation. Uh, for the 
we, because we are talking about integration of ATM and a UTM, but for the establish or safe, reliable UTM, the cooperation will be very, very important. We need a cooperation, international cooperation, regional cooperation, the cooperation between the industry, the regulators, the cooperation between traditional and untraditional traffic management, and definitely the cooperation between ATM and uh, UTM. The second point I wanted to point it out, which was not discussed, the liability. As a UTM software or system developer, uh, um, hardware manufacturers or solution providers or as operator of the UTM or maybe value-added service provider based on the UTM. Please also think about your liability. And the third point, which is quite connected with the liability, that is the regulatory framework. Now, not only the technical discussion, we also need to talk about the regulatory framework. Without aviation and the space, is, especially the aviation, it's quite unique area. Without regulation, which means no business. So the third point I want to talk is probably during the next year, we have to think about the regulatory framework. We know the UTM is quite national uh, issues, but we need, at global level, we still have to think about how the regulatory framework should be established. The fourth one I want to say is that let the amended aircraft, I, I'm not quite happy to use the drone, because the drone could jump, could swim, could also fly in the air. I still use aviation and uh, aircraft, so let the amended aircraft to fly. Please do not just try to stop them. Let them fly and try to find the solutions. And the last one is diversity. Now, it is, since it is quite an early stage, we need to be open. We accept different solutions, compare. Let the small or big amount of aircraft fly. Try to choose one from the diversified choices. So that is all the five points I wanted to add based on the discussion with our uh, panelists. Peter, you want to say some more? Uh, I'm going to, Mr. Work, yes. Uh, I'd like to approach the whole thing, uh, the suggestions from a totally different angle. Uh, what we're doing here is very, very constructive. But we seem to be speaking to each other here. There is a whole world out there who doesn't hear what we're doing here. That whole world has to be on board. So I would like to uh, suggest to ICAO that we look at creating a possibility of bringing out the information in a simple, understandable form to the rest of the world and not only in English. Uh, communication and access to information is extremely important, is going to get, is extremely important, is going to get more important as we progress. Because as we progress, uh, public acceptability is going to be more and more important. Now, hooked up to that, there's another thing. I was at the uh, ICAO Air Cargo uh, venue last week. And I think that it would be of interest for this side of the house to interact with that side of the house. Uh, they're a major stakeholder. They're going to be uh, creating a substantial amount of new jobs in the entire supply chain. But the supply chain, I learned that last week, they're still using paper. There is not a digital format from the guy who's creating the roses in Kenya to the supermarket uh, where those uh, roses are sold. In between, everything is still in paper. So they're in a certain, to a certain degree, they're behind the curve, but we have Alibaba 
uh, who's out there, who's already uh, using drones. We have Amazon who's going in that direction. Uh, but there are a whole bunch of other players in the supply chain that should be informed. So if we could create a closer symbiosis between our side of the house of ICAO and Air Cargo and integrate them into what we're doing, I think everybody would uh, benefit from it. Okay, that's good feedback. So, um, it's, it's not a um, comment to you, but it's a kind of commitment to me that uh, through this symposium, uh, I want to talk of what I thought. From my sessions, uh, I found a lot of, uh, a lot of UTM perspectives uh, but at the same time, we found that industries do their efforts and regulators do their efforts to speed up, like ANSP and the regulator shows the requirement for the airspace safety and UTM providers uh, try to give the solutions. And we discuss about how to speed up it, how to speed up and coordination is necessary. Uh, we say industries speedy and regulator is a little bit slow, but how about academies? We are so, so much slower than that. But on the other hand, for the coordination, like innovation management research could help it, or for the finding the requirements, we think complex, complex system safety designing researches or human factor research should be able to help you but we, we couldn't realize such importance like five years, six years before, so that we cannot help you. And what is going on here on the table are very, very important and interesting uh, things uh, for students and academic researchers. So I think uh, we, should, we should get more interest in this area, and if we can achieve the, uh, your, your sector's needs be, along before enough, then we can help you maybe in five years, in seven years. So that's my commitment that I want to do when I go back to home. And at the same time, you have a lot of perspectives. So this summer I had a pro uh, educational program to students to think about the society with EV tow uh, things. And students got interest and he spent a, they spent a lot of time. But after that, a single lecture a professor cannot give enough advices. But you are here, you have the same, uh, you have a lot of ideas, you have a lot of perspectives. So if you involve to the educational programs, then uh, we can work together and we can see the, the solutions for the futures. So that's what I thought from the symposium. Thank you. I think that's really important to uh, talk about how we're going to extend the, uh, the breadth of networking and engagement that has to happen to make this successful for the uh, remote piloted and drone programs. Nancy. I'm just trying to figure out, uh, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to dream the impossible dream, I guess. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I think you captured it. What happened here, I think you captured. We're, we're now talking about other things that yeah. may need to be added. <clears throat> That's the first thing. So congratulations on that. Second thing is uh, you're doing a heck of a lot of good stuff for an organization that isn't funded to do so. So damn good on you. Um, I still shake my head about that. Uh, I want to just play on what you said about the research. So 10 years ago, we worried a lot about the next generation of aviation professionals, not having enough pilots, not having enough mechanics, not having enough air traffic controllers. I'm so happy to see in this room lots of dark hair. Not on this, well, pretty much not on this stage, but out there, there's a lot of dark hair, which means you're young. And I think that this surgence of small UAVs has brought in a whole new cadre of talent. So that's a really good thing. And if there is a, I don't know that ICAO can do this, but if there is an overall sort of list of research that needs to be done, for example, the one to many, how many is one to many, and the human factors, gosh, we've done so much work on that, and 
the ATM arena, but it doesn't really translate to the next generation. So there's some of that. But the impossible dream for me is I have felt for enti my entire aviation career, and so much so at ICAO that I made a big fuss about it, industry has to have a bigger role at ICAO. Look, we talk about it in the hallway. The states just don't have the capability to come and build something and build the standards from scratch. They just don't anymore. It's a whole new world. ICAO has to modernize with what's needed. And I think out of this, what I'd like to see, and I don't know if you can politically do it. You'll have to decide. I don't know. But I think a message needs to come from this venue or the Drone Enable venue that industry has to play a larger role at ICAO, and that means you pay to play. But it, the organization that ICAO is funded to do the most important work in aviation on less than one wing of a 747. And that's crazy town, given how much is happening in the arena. That doesn't mean that there needs to be a tremendous burden to industry, but there needs to be a stronger voice from industry. Because industry has the talent now and industry has to bring that forward. The states just don't have it anymore. So I think that message, this is the proper venue for that to come from. I don't know how you want to shape that, but blame the audience. Don't blame yourself, but blame the audience that it came from the audience. But is there anybody who agrees with me that industry has to have a stronger voice going forward? Yes. So I think that's a really important notion that didn't come out directly, but indirectly and certain in the hallways that would be helpful um, and that does require industry to play together much more nicely and collaborate for what I call cooperation, you know? Cooperate until you get to competition. But I think that's an important message to come from this venue. Okay. So I think that's, uh, and that's actually an element of the conversation that's going to happen next month in the Air Navigation Conference because we have an entire agenda item that revolves around emerging issues, emerging entrants, uh, remote piloted vehicles, uh, UAS, commercial space, uh, all being driven by their industries. And frankly, I'm finding the states don't have enough information on their own to actually inform that conversation in the conference. So we're really depending upon the industry to come forward with papers, and you have, to, uh, to help that group of regulators understand the challenge and to see the, the gap that is growing uh, every day. Uh, there are two other aspects to that, though, and one is the, the challenge of uh, cyber resilience, and our response to that is the trust framework and how that is going to be, be defined, and the problem statement is what we're trying to get the states to agree to at the conference so that we can build on that as a foundation for all of this connectivity work. And the other piece of the work is reforming and accelerating the pace of safety oversight developments, because you know, I heard it this morning loud and clear from Dirk, and I know it from everyone else who's in this space. You're looking for how to get an approval so that you can make a business case, do an investment, prototype out, and get into business, and know that if you do it in one airspace, it's going to be applicable in most of the airspaces, if not all. And I think that is that that doesn't require that you do it at ICAO. It requires that you do it with an, with an ICAO outcome in the end in mind, and that we give a process to the states to be able to work with you to bring that forward in a way that's a, a much more rapid development. And I think that the, the states at ICAO are starting to recognize that it's time for that level of reform in the process. Their Navigation Commission and the Council are, are both, I think, open to the dialogue about how to do that. So that's really good feedback. Thank you. Um, you talked about academics, and I, I know that you know, many of you are involved in the Next Generation of Aviation Professionals program that ICAO is now uh, clearly committed to. Our second summit will be in Shenzhen in December related to that. And I think there, there was the traditional worry about, do we have enough pilots, enough controllers, enough engineers? Okay, that's great. We all know how to scale that. But this idea of now also needing to draw in machine learning and artificial intelligence experts and experts on computing and, and the things that are happening in this field and sensing and how we're going to uh, describe weather in a different way, that actually requires a lot more work in the pure research and academics field. 
And I think that the connection that ICAO is starting to have with people who can do that is really important. Dr. Liu, I know, or Professor, you've been involved in that. Would you like to add to that at all? Okay, according to the current version of the program of the, the NGAP in, in December in Shenzhen, just uh, two weeks before the Christmas holiday, we will waiting to welcome you there. According to the current version of the program, we will have one session to talk about such innovative, um, uh, innovative thinking, the uh, disruptive changes, and also what kind of the next generation of av aviation professional we needed to have. So, well, I would like also take this opportunity to say the aviation professional is not just a pilot, controllers, maintenance engineers. We also need definitely lawyers and also probably IT uh, 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 talents because in the future we will use artificial intelligence. They, uh, do, we don't need a pilot no matter on board or even on the ground. We will use the, the uh, artificial intelligence. Well, I also would like to give one uh, um, uh, feedback to uh, the session moderated by Nancy. Uh, we have talked about uh, how we may learn from the UTM to the high, very high level operation. But no matter whether the UTM could be uh, applied for the very high level operation, but the risk based um, operation centric regulatory framework could be applied to that category of operation. Uh, well, I just got a, one more idea. Probably we also need an, a, another group of people to help us for the regulation of the unmanned aircraft, that is third parties, not the uh, uh, traditional regulators, not the industry, but we need the third parties like qualified entity or designated uh, organization to help the regulator to uh, handle the big number of operations. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have any thoughts? You know, the Slido is still open, if I can connect to it. If anybody's got any burning questions or thoughts they might want to add in, you're welcome to do that. And then uh, we might just open up for a, for a shout or two if we have to. Um, no more burning thoughts? Mike? I think it's just pulling together some, some mental thoughts on what Bill was saying, the... Uh, the identification and the registration network, um, they start to become the facilitator of a completely digital aviation system. So we heard what Peter said about the, the paper trail. With that framework, we can build a completely digital aviation system, mm -hmm. a trust network where certificates of airworthiness for an aircraft, the whole aircraft records can be hooked to that trust network you get to the point where certificates of airworthiness and issuance, transfer of aircraft across registers, all becomes a digital world. The efficiencies and the cost benefits for doing that all start to fall into place with that trust network. So I really commend that activity to look much broader, much further, much deeper than just the obvious aspects that we're dealing with for this particular topic of unmanned aircraft. It's good feedback, and that is the intent. I think we're, uh, we're pretty excited about the idea that we could be digitized. And of course, um, we just passed a standard at ICAO in March that will come into force uh, um, next year permitting the use of electronic records by maintenance and repair organizations that will be internationally accepted. So again, how do you, how do you validate that that electronic record is a real record? We have to define those things. Our standard was a performance-based standard which now means that standards making organizations, technical specification organizations have to flesh out what that's gonna look like so that there is a level of trust between the regulators in the different parts of the world who are inspecting and reviewing the documentation that's provided with an aircraft, for instance. And uh, it's a start. Um, there, were, there were, you know, we talked about the fact that we need to have more academics. We need to be connected with the user community that will use this. Um, air cargo community. The, the larger airline community is very interested in this. They think there are a lot of applications and they're very interested in solving for this around the airport problem because of it. 
because they want to operate at the airport with drones. Um, I think the biggest unspoken aspect of this that I saw and that we all recognize is the implications for labor. Everybody knows that the people who are in the jobs traditionally today who manage airspace and operate airplanes have a very vested interest in the way things currently work. And they are part of the group that has to have the outreach for understanding how their world can be actually improved through the use of these tools. I actually don't see the introduction of technology as a threat to the livelihood of the people who are in the business today. I have, in my career in aviation, never seen an automation tool reduce the number of jobs. It has perhaps kept the number of jobs stable as we have exponentially grown the system. So we maybe don't, in the United States, there were 15,000 controllers 35 years ago. There are 15,000 controllers today. So think about the scale of what has happened to permit that level of growth with the same number of people. So the job did change. But you have to provide assurances to the people who are in the industry that their livelihood and their world is not going to be taken out from underneath them. And I think there is an, there's an interest, as Nancy said, the folks who are young who are coming into this business, they're looking at us and saying, really? The keyboard's upside down? I can't go any faster than 2,400 baud passing a flight plan? So they're ripe for the uptake that can occur here and many of the introductions of these technologies can happen right here in this space and then be transported into the traditional aviation space. And I think it helps to, uh, number one, make this industry more attractive to engage with for them, but number two, it then helps the remaining parts of the industry because you can prototype here so much more easily because you're not carrying people on the, on the vehicles. So I think it's, um, you know, the engagement that we've seen through the request for information in both drone enables and the passion that you've brought to telling us what the requirements are has actually been really valuable in helping us shape what regulatory processes need to do to change to be different. Uh, let me see if I've got anything from the Slido. I do, I have a couple. Okay. Anybody got any questions for each other? I think I've talked you out. Yeah, you worked out how okay. So, so uh, I have a I have a question. Director Creamer mentioned that there is a need for common approach to issue certificates and approvals for UAS operations. This week, SORA has been mentioned several times by representatives from many different countries as a good approach. Will ICAO build on SORA to work towards that goal? So who's in the panel or study group that wants to talk about that? Okay. So, so I said earlier in the panel, I, I think the JARUS filled a niche that ICAO couldn't fill at the time, and I think the work that's been done in the SOAR is good, solid work. Maybe tiny bit over-engineered, but we'll sort that out at the first few that happen. Fundamentally, I think ICAO absolutely should be working hand-in-glove with JARUS, and the degree to which they can bring that in and socialize that in a, a broader environment and then effectively stamp it as a, as a accepted practice is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I totally think ICAO should be collaborating with JARUS in that regard. Okay. So, so John here, and, and I agree with Nancy. Uh, Frederick Nordstrom is the uh, stakeholder consultation body uh, chairman for JARUS, and, and I'm honored to be the vice chair. Uh, we have, as uh, 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 Dr. Luhal knows, have two focus activities that are going on in, in the JARUS uh, world. Uh, we have to give credit to our friends at FOCA uh, as far as for the birth of, of SORA. I know that many states are ad adopting SORA, SORA principles. It is, it is viewed as a document that needs to grow, and, and I uh, strongly encourage, as Nancy indicated, to discover where the links need to be with ICAO. It's time to do that now. It's, there's some connection that needs to happen with the safety management system, that's clear. Yep. Uh, but it is a safety management product, and I think it, it's a natural sort of extension of that, so it makes okay. sense. Okay. Yeah, and I, you, you mentioned the safety management, and uh, what I, I don't think we've said in any of our briefings, we also see the safety management process that is essentially authorized and mandated by Annex 19 at ICAO as the license to do local development in states for global adoption. 
because it allows states to work with a proponent to identify and manage risk and implement change without waiting for a panel to do it, without waiting for global adoption of a change. If you're going into the high seas, yes, there's a, there's a requirement to get some ICAO documentation, but the vast majority of what we're doing here is in high seas work. So it makes really good sense to, uh, to utilize it, safety management as a way to go forward. Steve, may I make one more point? It's important to know for this, for this group, the Pacific Rim has a very strong, important role that's being played in the emerging technologies. There is a, a current uh, um, uh, Asia Pacific um, certification activity. It's led by representatives from the uh, Singapore CAAS and the FAA. There have been multiple meetings already in Wellington, in Seoul, in Bangkok. And it's important to know that that's affecting what certification requirements will be, and one of the basis being used is SORA. Okay. Well, on behalf of uh, JARAS, I would like to say, uh, uh, express our sincere thanks for our IQ colleagues to give JARAS such a good opportunity to share the deliverables of JARAS. So uh, SORA is one of our uh, BB, uh, could, read, could get so many uh, um, citations, could get so many uh, applications, we are so happy to know that. Uh, well, but for rules of uh, countries, all the industry who are using the product of the Sora, please also bring back, because our product is free, please bring back the safety data or your successful standard scenario so that we may share in the future. That is the price. I think that is the only price you needed to pay back to Jaras. Okay. All right, I've got a Slido comment here. That's good, that's really good. Uh, not enough discussion was had on efforts to bring all of the different drone regulations around the world closer together. What industry wants from ICAO is for stronger movement to international alignment. Is it possible to get a stronger commitment on action on this. Okay, let me take this for you because you can't. All right, Nancy. Okay, go Nancy, ahead. You, you never know what I might do. But you're go the ahead. director now, so you can't say this. But look, the the Secretary General said I don't know how many times in her speech that that it's perceived to be a domestic issue, right? Small UAVs, drones, domestic issue. Our pass, international issue. If the message wasn't clear there, let me make it very clear: is that's that's seen as a, as a domestic issue, and it's not an ICAO, perhaps mandate is the wrong word, but it's not an ICAO responsibility. So I think that's, I disagree with that. I think that's wrong. I think it's very narrow thinking, but that's the direction that she's been given by the council. That's not her, she didn't make that up. So that's the direction the council has given. What you need to do is change the council's mind. And with that comes a level of responsibility. So. Uh, that's the bottom line, is that has to come from the politicals of where you, where you come from, and that has to change ICAO's mind. I fundamentally think it's a mistake, uh, and I think we need to change it, but it's, that's a political issue. Okay, thanks for that. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> I don't want anybody to quote you, okay? <laughs> okay. This is an interesting question, so I'm going to ask it. So we've been talking about drones. Traditional aviation. They can use innovations from the drone and UTM world. What future, what will the future of traditional civil aviation look like? What should they insert in their systems? Now, before you answer, I had written down for myself three questions about airspace that have come from the talks here. And there are three aspects to airspace that I think have a big impact on risk, on accessibility, and on what you intend to do with the airspace. A lot of people talked about operations that are predictable today. And I was struck by some of the precise navigation requirements some of the concepts currently lay out. So predictability. Directly opposite to that is what many people in aviation want, and that is flexibility. They want the ability to operate wherever and whenever they want, 
I know some aviators in Alaska who want to operate where they want without telling anybody because it's their favorite fishing hole, right? And then we have the question of responsibility. When are you responsible for your behavior in the airspace system, and what is the, the interaction between your responsibility and another vehicle? So we've heard a lot about, we can't see drones, I can't avoid them, so is there a need to think in the future for what we're going to have to equip the civil aviation fleet with so that they have the ability to interactively avoid or engage with the, uh, the predictable autonomous vehicles which we're trying to put into service for a completely separate set of industries? You can't answer that here, I bet, but food for thought, and if anybody wants to throw two cents in, you're welcome. So um, I think there's a, there's a couple of areas where this industry can help the traditional industry. We're already seeing that te the technology developments providing smaller, lighter, uh, lower cost devices that manned aviation or traditional aviation can use. And we, I think we will continue to see that sharing of technical development. I think we've been talking about UTM. Um, one of the things within that, we're seeing the development of no-fly zones or drone zones. Um, that's defining a new class of airspace. Um, and that airspace in a digital world can be created and changed and moved in real time. So we're actually developing the technology to design the airspace in real time. That is going to change how we can plan and manage the trajectories of all aircraft. And that 4D trajectory objective becomes real for drones now. Um, for the future, why can that not be expanded into all airspace? Um, so the potential for this technical revolution and evolution we have will grow into traditional aviation and influence it on a daily basis, I think. Yeah. Okay. And, and I think the need for that and how that evolves will very much depend upon the mix of users. It doesn't have to be all airspace all at once. Um, one of the things we try and do at ICAO now is instead of having the solution, we try and think about what's the question. We learned that from somebody out in Silicon Valley. And, and the, so a lot of what we've been listening for here is what's the problem? What are we trying to solve for? And what is ICAO's role in assisting with solving? ICAO's role isn't to create the tech. ICAO's role isn't to win the political argument. ICAO's role is to provide you with the most cost-effective, interoperable set of regulatory processes that we can so that the states will give you an operating environment that you can make some money in and have some consistency. And so, I hear a lot about, you know, ICAO needs to do this or that. We do work really hard at bringing people together for that dialogue so that we can have those interactions. But as we had that spirited conversation about ATM and UTM earlier today, it's even more spirited when I get all of the different kinds of operators in the room. And I think that we're really going to have to hammer on that, and we're also going to have to have a real conversation about how we can best evolve the public's view about um, environment noise and uh, the nuisance factor that comes with uh, perhaps having a drone landing in your neighborhood to pick somebody up to take them to work, right? So it's an interesting uh, set of challenges and one that will require that we have another drone enabled. I think that's pretty clear based upon uh, where we're at right now. So we're getting close to time to wrap this up. I'd like to ask each of you if there's anything you want to share that is uh, the last lingering thought, you're, please, you're welcome to, uh, to bring that on. Peter, there's always something left in your brain. There, there isn't really this time. And um, I'm asking myself why. Uh, I'm... You're all used to this. I'm going to do a, non, a very non-political, acceptable thing. 
yes, there is something in my mind. Okay. Uh, we seem to be going ahead here in a consorted way. We're working together. We've got all kinds of stakeholders and we've got objectives that we're defining together. In Europe, we have 28 countries still for the moment. There'll be one less in March next year. Um, we're bringing these guys together around a regulation. That's fantastic. It's not easy. Uh, IASA uh, should be applauded for what they were, they've achieved in such a short time. Now, when we look at this, what can the rest of the world learn from that? Uh, we, did part, we did it partially right. When that regulation comes into, uh, into effect sometime next year, mid next year, is it going to make a big change for the operators that exist today? Probably not really. Because the things that we're referring to in the regulation, like standard scenarios, like standards and all that stuff, they're not there. Right. So when we relate that to ICAO, <laughs> uh, we, we're done paying the rent. <laughs> okay. Try again. Let's pass another mic over there. So when we, when we re, uh, transfer this, what's going on in Europe to ICAO, what can we learn from that? Because there, there are probably things that we can learn. Uh, one of the things is that I've always been bitching about the slowness of ICAO. Uh, and I've named you guys the slowest uh, organization in the world, worse than NATO. Um, but here, maybe it comes out why you're so slow. You're foreseeing things. And these, uh, this foreseeing helps avoid creating problems like we're not go going to have in Europe. Now, airspace, it's all about airspace. It's about access to airspace. How we're going to do that in a safe way, acceptable way. We haven't figured that out yet in Europe, but we have a regulation. So uh, there's a balance there, yin and yang, it has to go together. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm taking away from what's happening here, what I've seen here, is that uh, ICAO is very well tuned to, well, they're, they're the only one that can actually create this balance. Uh, but to be able to do that in the world that is going, the aviation world that is going to change dramatically, you cannot do that alone. You've indicated, uh, as Nancy has indicated, that the states uh, can't do it on their own. Industry has to be, come in and has to participate more, be more actively involved in everything. And then we come to a very interesting situation because it's not just industry. You've got the big boys, you've got the small boys. And where a lot of the developments that are now coming out, all these startups, they're not multi-billion dollar companies. And we have to find ways of getting them involved, actively involved, earlier than we're doing at the moment. Um, how we're going to do that, I don't know, because these guys are looking, how can I pay the rent at the end of the month? Um, but we have to find ways of doing this. And that brings with it a thought that I have been trying to push out in Europe for quite some time, is to do more through internet, remotely, so that you can involve these stakeholders who are out there, but haven't got the time or the money to come to ICAO. So uh, maybe that's also a thought that in the opening of the mind of ICAO that we look at 
how can we get these other stakeholders that are very important for us involved without having, making it necessary for them to sit uh, in Montreal uh, for a week. Exactly. Well, and that's part of what we're also thinking through how to do. That's one of the reasons. Everything in the Drone Enable and RPAS 3 have been uh, loaded up on YouTube. On the ICAO website, you can get access to see all the presentations and all the discussions and remarks anywhere in the world. And that's actually a pretty recent change for ICAO, to be in a position to where we can start to do that. And beyond that, we do want to promote the idea of distant collaboration so that we don't have to necessarily do all of our work in a face-to-face -face session. I will admit, though, periodically, face-to-face -face is key, just so that we can bring people like you to the same place to have a dialogue in a way that is very interactive and personal. And, um, but I do appreciate the feedback. It's where we want to go. Nancy. I don't have anything to add except to say thank you to the organizers here, to those that have welcomed us. Thank you for being open. Thank you for listening. Thank you to the staff. I know how hard it is to put one of these together. Um, and just to say, uh, it's an extraordinarily exciting time to be in aviation. Yes, we have a lot of challenges. But it's an incredibly exciting time. And I hope we leave here really enlivened with that notion. Mm -hmm. New talent, new thinking, new people, new investment. It's a really exciting time. So, yeah, we get challenges. But, but what's ahead of us is a really, really exciting time. Yeah, uh, same. Um, we, we face up with very, very complex uh, situations. And uh, I, I feel very warm right now because you, too, not only in Japan, uh, but the uh, um, sectorial company, uh, country, but uh, you also have facing challenging to this complex world. But uh, yes, if we can work together, uh, we can find a future single sky. So uh, I'm very excited to this. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as Nancy, thank, thank, thank you to the host and Steve, thank you for your leadership with your team led by uh, Leslie as far as making this happen. Uh, I, I would like to just reiterate one, one point I made earlier and that is what is happening on the Pacific Rim. It is extraordinary. Uh, as I mentioned, I am, have the honor to be the uh, chair of the uh, ISO UAS committee. Uh, the, the coordination we're having with uh, Japan is extraordinary. The fact we have a UTM working group that has been put forth and led by a Japanese delegation. Our Chinese delegation is doing a, a special project on classification. I will be in uh, 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 back in um, uh, uh, Shanghai next week at Shaoxing at a standards conference. There is a recommendation by the Chinese delegation uh, for a pilot training program. The Republic of Korea has a, uh, uh, an effort going on pilot licensing. There is a vibrant activity going along the Pacific Rim. So one thing I would say, Steve, and, and I'm out of my bailiwick now, I, or out of my league, and, and this is where Nancy may hit me or not. But I think it's interesting that the regional ICAO offices, whether they're engaged at active level, level or inactive, I don't know. I know that uh, Dr. Lu Hao is in Bangkok with the Bangkok office. I do not know what's going on in Lima. I do not know what's going on in Mexico City. I just don't know. Uh, so, so it'll be very interesting as far as to have a sense of what role they can play in this global outreach that Peter's been talking about. Thank you. Uh, I think from me, I, I have to second what my fellow panelists have, have said. The, the one additional point I would make is, it's, it's been said many times, that we're all in this one journey together. We all have parts to play. We heard many requests for harmonization and standardization and development of these. Um, and we've heard several times here that that's a joint effort from everybody. I think the one thing to add to that, as we've just mentioned, to make those more timely, more effective, we have to evolve the processes by which they are developed. And it's not just an ICAO process. Every regulator I work with has processes which do not align with the, time, the life cycles and timescales of this industry. So don't forget that we all have to help those processes evolve. 
and help everybody have the tool sets to work to those time scales. Or we'll all just get continue to be frustrated. Okay, since so this is the ending of the uh, second industry symposium, uh, just the one thing I want to point it out that is I want to introduce one group of people. They have never been put on the stage. They're hidden behind of the curtain, but they are working for us. Namely, the uh, CAFUC, the Civil Aviation University, uh, Civil Aviation Flight University. And I, now I would like also to speak in Chinese to express our thanks to their team. Uh, okay, the, 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 the Chinese version is the same to the English, so you don't need to use the devices. Extend a big thank you to uh, the um, students and the colleagues from the university. They didn't come onto the stage. They they didn't. They are not mentioned in the speeches or any presentations. But they have been working for us during the whole process. So this is the only thing that I want to do before we wrap up this session. Thank you so much. Please join me in. To our Kafuk colleagues. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu, for your support to help us with the initial development of uh, what this was going to look like. And yes, to my colleagues at Kafu, the colleagues in the Sichuan government, and um, the, the local community, you have been superb hosts, and we really do appreciate it. I also have to acknowledge the ICAO team. I'll just ask everybody to stand up if they're in the room, and that includes the regional ICAO team. So, so you're looking at the sole content of the ICAO capacity to pull off a drone enable on the side of all of the other standards and recommendations activity that we do. And this group has worked incredibly hard to make this a real interaction that hopefully provides some benefit to the industry and then to our collective states that are depending upon us to help guide them on where to go with UTM and the developments in the RPAS drone world. I just want to thank those of the, the folks on the team. Bill Voss, you came out uh, to do the uh, discussion about the cyber because it is a foundational element, I believe, in the overall architecture that has to come forward with this for a global system that interacts. And for the two gentlemen from the regional office, um, one from Bangkok and one from our regional sub-office in Beijing. Yes, we are all on a steep learning curve about what's going on in this industry so that we can support it. And one of the reasons that they've come to join us is so that they can be part of that learning, just like the rest of us. And I think you're going to see more and more activity in the regional offices, probably spearheaded by the APAC, because this is where the action is in terms of the developments uh, in the industry designing and now also operating these vehicles. So we've come almost to the end. Are we going to do this again? Anybody think we shouldn't? OK. So November 12 to 14 is the tentative date that we're setting in Montreal next year for Drone Enable 3. We'll have more details coming out shortly. The request for information is expected to be published probably in the late October, early November time frame after the Air Navigation Conference, where we will have taken some additional input from the states to help us refine and shape the, uh, the questions that we pose, coming first with the material out of this uh, symposium, but also informed by the proposed work program that the states tell us that they want us to engage in. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what we finalize that question to be, and then how many of you we can have re-engage with us to uh, return and progress this industry one more increment forward in the international arena, hopefully close to the pace that you need for the business developments that you are undertaking in this very exciting arena. Finally, thanks to my moderators, to our moderators, for the wonderful job you've done over the last two days and uh, for all of the work that you did helping the presenters to prepare. We wish you all uh, safe travels home and continued success in all of the engagements that you're involved in to make uh, remote piloted and unmanned aircraft a success. Thank you all very much.
And to our audience, thank you for perseverance to five o'clock on Friday afternoon in Chengdu. We wish you all a wonderful evening, a great weekend, safe travels home. We'll see you at the next event. So long. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please um, return the headset for simultaneous interpreting. Thank you very much. A headset at the entrance.